By the music, bro. Can't you tell by the love you felt before you took one step through the door? And that next level teaching God is reaching higher every week. Frequent flyer speaking life despite deceased and vibra. Meant to be in cause he's inside. It's not a private party, you're invited. Come in tired, believe inspired. All generations, even cyber. Find us on the web like we some spiders. Uh, let's slow it down so you understand how it's going down. Up in here, there's one brew. Gotta love everybody that comes through. Them doors, in short. Grace is what we endorse. Faith is what we help grow. So welcome to the fam center, you know. Well, peace, peace, peace. I come in peace, peace and greetings, faith, the live ministries and all of our online guests. Happy Tuesday, everybody, and welcome to the Boost Bible Study, where we boost the faith of the believer and we boost the interests of the seeker. I am so excited to have all of you with us in the Cyber Sanctuary. I believe this Tuesday is going to be absolutely incredible. Here's why. A couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with a group of incredible men about what manhood truly looks like in the kingdom of God. Now, I know some of you are saying, oh, this is a Bible study just for men. No, it's not. This is everything that every man of God and every woman of God needs to know about God's intention for men of God. We're all in this together. And I want to share some things with you that I believe will be very beneficial for the listener. Whether you are a mother with sons, a wife with a husband, Etc. You just need to hear this message. And all the men out there that are watching, I'm telling you, I believe this is going to empower you immensely. My father, myself, and all these incredible guys had this conversation. So I want to show you that. But before we do that, I need all of you to demonstrate some online outreach right now. Press, share, invite your family, your friends, your followers, even your foes into the fellowship to hear the message of faith. And then I want you guys to get involved in the comment section this entire conversation. I really believe this is going to bless y'all. So please get involved in the comment section. Now, y'all, there's no solicitation. There's no debate. If you do that, they're going to remove you. But outside of that, we're going to have a great time, a great dialogue, a great conversation. And I'll be right back after we air this. I'm telling y'all, this is dope. I really enjoyed it. So please press share, invite somebody, let them know what's going down. Watch this quick video. And right after that video, we're going to the sanctuary and have a conversation about what manhood looks like in the kingdom of God. Welcome to the Boost Bible Study, everybody. Your love is in Christ. Your love is in Christ. 
discusses in Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 29 in the New Living Translation, it says this, for who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger, someone who could tie him up and yes. then plunder his house. But that passage of scripture is actually Jesus discussing the demonic realm. He's saying the reason why I can cast out demons is because I have more power than they have. Right. So he uses an analogy and he says the only way that you can go into a man's house and take his stuff is either you have to be stronger than him and you got to tie him up. Now, most of us, if a four-year-old came in your house and tried to rob you with a butter knife, you would be able to just throw him out because you have more strength than what they have. And he was bringing out an analogy saying that the only way you can actually take over someone's goods or you can actually diminish the quality of a man is you got to tie him up. That's a principle. It's a principle. And it's a principle that Satan knows that if I can tie a strong man up, I can take everything from him. And that's not just talking about ropes. It's not talking about vines. It's not talking about chains. It's talking about the addictions, the cravings, the things that we struggle with, insecurity, the fears, the doubts. If we get tied up in all of that, we become less of who we are, and then we don't accomplish what's actually on the inside of us. A lot of men go to the grave full of potential. And we hear people talk about potential. Man, that guy's got a lot of potential. What good is potential if it don't come out? That's right. So there's a lot of you in this room, you got great potential. Potential to be an entrepreneur, potential to be a multimillionaire, potential to be athletic, potential to have a thriving business. But God doesn't want you to just have potential. He wants to see the potential that he placed in you manifest so that you can be the fullness of who he's called you to be. But the enemy wants to tie you up. And so we're going to talk this evening. And the Lord gave me an acronym. When you look at the word strong, S-T-R-O-N-G, he gave me an acronym from that. And I want to talk about the qualities of a strong man with that acronym of S-T-R-O-N-G. The S stands for student. A strong man is always a student. And this, especially in our community, is one issue that we have, Bishop, is that a lot of men are unteachable. They believe that they're beyond teaching. I don't care how old you are, how educated you are, how skilled you are. We are all in a position where we can still learn something. And the more learning that you allow yourself to submit to, the more powerful you become. I don't care who you are. And one of the reasons why many of you struggle is the spirit of pride that won't allow you to submit to teaching. The true teacher knows he's always a student. The true person that actually walks in wisdom knows he's always a student. And I got a verse to prove it. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 15 in the New Living Translation. This is what the Bible says, Pastor McCray. Intelligent people are always ready to what? Learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. Now notice the description the Bible gives us of an intelligent person, Bishop. is not necessarily someone that has accumulated great knowledge in a specific area. Because you would assume a person that's a rocket scientist, they're intelligent. But the Bible says intellect is actually proven by one's willingness to continue learning. That's right. So if I look at a person that's submitted to the idea of learning, that actually speaks to their intelligence. What do you have to say about that, Bishop, as concerning a person who is a continual student? Well, I, th I think you have to understand that, and, I, and the analogy and the example that I use would be sports. How that many times, and I saw a, a great, great example of this with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Yeah. How that through the years his body got weaker, and the gentleman from the San Antonio Spurs, uh, Tim Duncan, Tim Duncan, yeah. and and his body got weaker, and he couldn't do the things that he did, and so he improvised and learned to do his game a little differently Different that made him very successful. And even as men, regardless of how we are, we have to be willing to learn to be yeah. better than what we are. Absolutely, and there's so many people that are beyond learning, which is why they're beyond God gracing them with new dimensions, new opportunities. You have to always be willing to learn. doesn't matter who you are. Example, some of you are absolutely phenomenal in the area of finances. And so because you have conquered in that area, you feel like you don't have anything to learn about communication. So as a husband, as a boyfriend, as a brother, as a whatever, you may be great in your finances but horrible in your communication. Well, I'm already 56 years old. That doesn't mean that you're beyond learning the power of communication. That's right. Because most of us really don't understand communication. Talking is not communication. Everybody can talk. But communication is also listening with an intentional ear. 
I promise you, there are many of you in this room right now, there are little things that you could learn right now that could tweak your life and you would go from being struggling, and go from struggling in your finances to go to a place of stability or something even in your career. You might be good at something and feel like I've mastered it. We had a dentist. He was a great dentist. But his practice didn't stay open because he refused to keep learning the, the modern procedures they were using. So all these young people were coming out of dental school taking all of his clients because they were learning the new procedures. He was still hurting people's mouths. And I remember when I went to my new dentist, I was so used to him because he didn't know the new procedures. I just knew everything she did was going to hurt. This woman uh, drilled a cavity out of my mouth and put a crown in and I fell asleep while she was doing it because she was so good with the new procedures, but he didn't want to learn, so he ended up losing all of his customers. It wasn't that he couldn't learn, it was that he wouldn't learn. That's right. And so a real man is always going to be a student. The second, second letter in that is T, which stands for temperance. Yes. Temperance represents self-control. And as believers, if we claim to have the Holy Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. The book of Galatians chapter number 5 and verse 22 in the New King James Version says this. But the fruit of the Spirit, how many of you have ever heard this, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. This is the stuff that we as men are supposed to have. Listen to this quality, brothers, kindness. In our community, we're taught to be hard, be gangster. No, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I love this word, gentleness. And what's the last one? Self-control. Self-control literally means I have the ability to restrain myself. Yes. Now, everybody in here at one point or another has wanted to knock somebody out. You got to restrain yourself. You've wanted to say some things. Now, y'all ain't going to be quiet now. We didn't all want to cut somebody out at some point or another. But you had to restrain yourself. That speaks to self-control. Let's go even further. I don't care how much you love your woman. There's always going to be someone that is attractive to you and some of them are attracted to you and they've made it known that they're attracted to you. And the only thing that keeps you from doing what your flesh wants to do, because your flesh is nasty too, That's right. is you have to use restraint, self-control. That is you demonstrating a submission to the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about that for a minute. Well, I think a lot of times the distractions that we face in our communities because of a lack of self-control. Yes, sir. People act on their emotions and what they think and how they feel. Yeah, you can't always act on how you feel. And I, and I see, say this from experience, that one of my biggest probably problems or one of my biggest distractions in life is the way people drive. <laughs> and that's got a lot to do with the fact that I ride a motorcycle. Yeah. And a lot of times when you're riding a motorcycle and people cut you off, immediately you want to do something or say something. But That's you right. have to learn to control yourself and not act on it. I remember I just was doing a great ride a number of times and somebody cut me off and could have knocked me over, but they didn't. And so the thing I think on is the good part of it. Yeah. They didn't hit me. I am alive. I'm not injured. And so, you know, you have to learn self-control. And that's in speech and in actions. Well, I'm glad you brought up speech. Let's turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter number 17 and verse 27 in the New Living Translation. One of the greatest issues that men have is the inability to control their mouth. Self-control. Watch this. A truly wise person uses few words. Yes. A person with understanding is even-tempered. Yes. That speaks to self-control. Watch this, y'all. Wisdom says I learn how to say more with less words. I learn how to say more with less words. Now, this is no disrespect to our sisters. God bless all of you that are watching online. But oftentimes women are a little better at expressing themselves verbally than men are. And they can talk for a very long time. Now, most of them don't realize we don't even retain everything that they're saying. We kind of go into a whole Charlie Brown, wah, 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 and zone out after a while. But wisdom learns how to say more in less time. Because we have a short attention span, but it says you're even-tempered. Even-tempered means that I get to a point where I can control myself to whereas I don't allow, like you said, my feelings to run me. And this is important. Now watch this. Let's look at Proverbs 17 and 14. The Bible says starting a quarrel is like opening a floodgate. So stop before a dispute breaks out. Stop. What is stop? Restraint. Your self-control. It is somebody cutting you off. You ever had somebody cut you off and they gave you the finger or they did something to you and then you start following them. 
You just follow them because you want to do something. How many people are in prison right now because of an emotional decision? How many people right now are away from their families because they got caught up in an instant of emotion or that one little moment where so-and-so said this or this person presented this to you and you acted on how you felt? But the scripture says when you see something coming, you got to learn to stop. You got to catch yourself. You have to consider in that moment, man, what's on the other side of this decision? Is there a consequence on the other side of what I feel like doing right now? I need y'all to think about that just for a moment. David, in the scriptures, saw a woman that was bathing on a rooftop. She is naked, and the Bible says she was gorgeous. Bathsheba was fine. And this was his best friend's, one of his best friend's wives. And he was looking at her. Here's the problem. He kept looking. That's right. Now, that's one thing, Lauren, for us to acknowledge. The problem is y'all keep looking. Can I give y'all a secret of YPJ and how I'm able to handle myself? I acknowledge it. I've seen it. It's there, but I don't keep looking. Because if I look too long, you're going to want it. Doesn't matter who you are, y'all. The flesh is what? Weak. And so David kept looking. The next thing you know, he ended up having an adulterous relationship. But he didn't think about what was on the other side of his decision. He just wanted the gratification of the moment. And after he got done, he got her pregnant. Now you got a whole issue when he was trying to work it out. Couldn't work it out. Ended up having his friend killed. That didn't fix it. The girl has the baby, the baby dies, then she ends up getting pregnant again because he marries her. And now all this chaos and sights in his household with all of his other children because of a decision that he made. And let's just say the sex only lasted two minutes. You did all of that two minutes for a legacy, an issue that was broken up in a generational curse that was released because of a lack of self-control. Being even tempered is very, very critical because in your character, you, people can't wonder how is he going to be today? How is she going to be today? Yeah. Because having a, a balanced temperament, a balanced character spiritually and naturally is very critical. And I'm not saying that we don't get upset or we don't yeah, display sure. emotional times, but being even tempered is so very important to know when people see me, they don't have to guess how I'm going to be. I'm going to be basically the same when they see me all the time. Walking on eggshells. Yeah, walking on eggshells. Well, you just said it. How many of you have ever been angry? Come on, hands up, brothers. How many of y'all have been angry? You know anger is not a sin, right? right. The Bible says, be angry. And do well, what? Sin not. The action on the other side of the emotion is where the sin comes from. So we understand that emotions are a part of what we deal with. But yeah. we have to be even-tempered. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Cool. So, all right, y'all, the next letter. Let's keep it moving. And this, <laughs> I was looking at this one earlier today and I said, God, this is something that may be challenging for some of the men, the R. It stands for repent. Real men repent. A strong man will repent. What is represent, representation of repentance? Those of you that are watching online. To repent is not an apology. That's right. Because a lot of y'all think, man, I repent for what I did. It's not an apology. To repent, Pastor McCray, actually means an about face. It means turning the other direction. It's a change of your mind, Tim. That's what it represents. It's the change of the mind. Here's why a lot of you struggle with that. Because if you've been doing something your own way for many, many years, and you've been getting by doing it your way, you may think your way is right until somebody reveals to you that your way is wrong. Question is, are you going to turn and repent? Wally just got married. When you was living by yourself, you do whatever you want. You get married, you got three women in the house. It's different, ain't it? They mad at you. Who left the toilet seat? I mean, I left the toilet seat. I'm the only one in here that would need to do that. So he has to repent. In other words, he has to turn a behavior or change the mind. We think repent is like a bad thing. Like, I repented. Uh, I was in sin. No, sometimes repenting is saying I wasn't raised to love my children the right way. Because maybe my parents didn't understand the distribution of love. So you emulate what you were told. But what if what you were told wasn't the right way? So you have to change your way of thinking. There's some of you in this room that won't admit it, but you, Mary guys, your wife might be better with the money than you are, but your ego, I'm the man of the house, and now y'all house all toe up. Y'all ain't got no lights on, nothing, because it has nothing to do with manhood when you discuss skill and knowledge in a specific area. Can you repent and say, okay, baby, I'll bring home the bacon, but I'm gonna let you fry. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you understand. So I think repentance becomes important. Look at the book of Romans chapter number 12 and verse number 2. The New Living Translation gives us an idea of how God wants us to behave when it comes to our thinking process. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, the secular world, but let God transform you into a new person. I want you guys to look at this. 
By changing what? The way you think. The way I change my life is by changing the way I think. If I change how I think, I change what I do. Simple as that. If I change my thinking about a thing, I change what I do. Then he says this, if you change your thinking, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So without repentance or a changing of the thought process, I can't even find out what God's will for my life is, which is why so many men don't know what they're supposed to be doing. You're still out here experimenting and God is saying, you've been experimenting for 20 years. Still finding new, I got a new girl. You too old to have a new girl. At some point, you got to start figuring out how to settle down in life and figure out what my direction is and my focus and my goal. I got another idea. I got another pyramid scheme I'm a part of. It comes a point where you have to say, Lord, I want to know what is your will for my life? And God says, my will for your life is good and pleasing and perfect. When you get that revelation through repentance, that's when things begin to change. And, and repentance actually means go in a different direction. That's it. You can't continue in the same direction because many times that leads to death or destruction yeah. or injury not only to yourself but to others. And I, and I say this from the spirit, from experience and from the position of being saved or living for the Lord. If I would have continued in the direction that I was going, which we all have a past, God only knows where I'd be or if I'd be. So yes, it means actually going a different direction. Sometimes you have to admit in your life that you're not going in the right, right. direction. I need to try something different. I need to go in a different direction. So that's very critical a lot of times. Do you know that many times people win the lottery? And I, I'm not against you playing the lottery. I just pray that if you win the lottery that you'll pay your tithes. Pay your tithes. But do you know that 70% or more people that ever win the lottery end up broke again? Yes, sir. Yes, you know sir. why? Because there's no mindset change. When the mind doesn't change, money, won't, money if you don't change your mind, money won't, won't, won't matter to you. Bishop. If you give a drug addict twenty dollars, what's he gonna buy with that twenty dollars? First thing he's gonna do, go to the drug house. If you give him twenty million dollars, what's he gonna do with that money? He's gonna buy twenty million dollars worth of drugs. It doesn't money doesn't people talk about money changes you. No, actually money exposes you. That's right. It reveals who you really are. And so if I don't change my mindset, I can get a brand new car, but if I didn't take care of the last one I got, it's only six months before that car started looking like the last car I had. A lot of y'all, man, yeah, I met a new girl, man, you know what I'm saying, I really like her. Well, I want to see how your last relationship was. Because it's only a matter of time before this one looks like the last one, That's if right. you haven't changed your thinking. Because sometimes, gentlemen, we're wrong. Some of y'all really struggle with that, just saying, how many of y'all know sometimes you're wrong and you just struggle to say it? Your wife be right, your girlfriend be right, your kids be right. But you struggle with it, like, I don't want, sometimes I'm in church telling you, you know I'm right, you struggling, I don't want to receive that, YPJ. But sometimes we're wrong. Thank God for telling us when we're wrong so we can get it right. Amen. All right, now, the O stands for obedient. A strong man is obedient. The book of Isaiah chapter number one and verse number 19 in the King James Version says this. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Now, in proper context, Bishop, this passage of scripture is where God was speaking through the prophet. He says this, if you do what I tell you to do, I'm going to bless you. But That's then right. if you read the next verse, he says, but if you disobey me, there's a curse associated with it. You remember when he talked to Moses, he said, Moses, I'm going to set before the people a blessing and a cursing. You got to choose which one you want. He says, I set before you this day life and death. Then he gives you the cheat code. He says, choose life. In other words, you have a decision on whether or not you will obey my will for your life. And when you obey God, he says, you will eat of the good of the land. Or in other words, you're going to experience the benefits of life, not in heaven, but you're going to get heaven on earth. So a lot of people are trying to escape. I can't wait to get to heaven. God is like, no, I want you to be beneficial and prosperous down here on earth. A lot of you that are watching online, you got to stop looking for the by and by and start praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But he says it's predicated on obedience. And what people don't know is worship is not waving your hands. Yeah. Somebody, I want to worship you, Lord. That's praise, waving your hands. I just want to worship you, start dancing. Worship is a yieldedness of the heart. Yes. It's just, yes, God. Yeah. So I, I would ask you all the question. Have you ever had that voice in your heart tell you to do something? Yeah. You felt it. You, Brother Greg, you ever had the Lord tell you to tell your wife something and you didn't want to say it because you was mad? Come on, tell the truth. <laughs> huh? That's why you laugh because you know. Now, the question you got to ask yourself in that moment is, am I going to obey God or am I going to stay in my flesh? 
Because God is going to always give you an instruction that has a blessing on the other side of it. But do you have the humility to do it? That's the question. Do you have the humility? I've been in church services where God Bishop has told me, sow this amount of money. And I didn't come to church to get that amount of money. And I'm like, man, I didn't really come for that, Lord. But I got a question. Am I going to submit to the yes or am I going to stay in my flesh? Simple as that. On the other side of that, he says, you will eat of the good of the land. So it speaks to the power of choice. The book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, the scripture talks about trust in the Lord with all thine yeah. heart yeah. and lean not to thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he gives us proper direction for our lives. If we be obedient to God, so many blessings that God can bestow upon us that we miss simply by because we're being obedient or if we're being disobedient, we miss the blessings of the Lord. So a lot of times being blessed, and I'm not talking about just money, but being blessed in body and spirit and everything depends on our willingness to be obedient to God. Simple as that. Even our health. God will deal with you about your health and you won't do it and then you wonder why you still don't feel well. Because conviction comes in various forms. It comes in various ways. God, I was sharing with Tim Sunday, God has been convicting me about my diet. So there are certain things I enjoy, but my body feels them every time I eat them. Are you going to keep ignoring that for the pleasure of the flesh? Yeah. Because what's pleasurable ends up miserable when you walk in disobedience. I just said something right there, y'all. What's pleasurable ends up miserable when you walk in disobedience. So when you feel that thing saying, forgive, obey. Yeah. When you feel that thing, that's what you call it. Something told me to, to, to do this. If something is the Lord that's been dealing with you about it. The Lord will tell you to go home when you want to go hang out with your friends. That's right. So you have to learn to respect that feeling that wants you to walk in obedience. Well, even in our decisions in life, as far as making financial decisions or whatever, or life challenging, changing decisions, you have to learn obedience because many times we cause ourselves many hardships. We bring them up on ourselves yeah. by simply being uh, disobedient and not listening to the voice of the Lord. And one example that I'll use, and this was many, many years ago, my wife and I were searching for a car and uh, we loved the car that the salesman had shown us and we, we, we said, oh man, this car is awesome. Yeah. And while we was in the office with the salesperson that was ready to seal the deal, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and my wife both, and I didn't even tell her that the Lord had spoke to me, said, don't buy that car. And we both loved the car. I remember it was a Monte Carlo. It was a beautiful. And lo and behold, we, we got home. I said, honey, the Lord told us not to buy that car. She said, wow, the Lord told me the same thing. And I got laid off from work the very next day. Now, then I would have had this car payment, raising my kids, all of that if I'd have been disobedient to the voice of the Lord. So that, that has a lot to do with it, being obedient. And then you ended up getting something nicer. Oh, something much nicer. Later yeah. On, yes. That's the thing, man. A lot of times we think that God is trying to deny us. He's delaying us for a reason. There's always a reason for that. I need y'all to start following that conviction that you feel, that feeling that you get. You got to start following that and saying, okay, something is to this. I need to respond to that. Um, it's so important. All right, let's get to the end. The end stands for noble. The word noble means having high moral qualities or integrity. A strong man is noble. A strong man has integrity. A strong man is honest. He has proper intentions. He's trustworthy. That's what nobility represents. Look at the book of Proverbs, chapter number 11 and verse 3. It should be up there. Yeah. The Bible says, the integrity of the upright shall guide them. Mm -hmm. But the willful contrariness and crookedness of the treacherous, all the isses, shall destroy them. So if I walk in integrity, that's honesty, proper intention, trustworthiness, it's going to guide me in life. But when I walk in crookedness, when I walk in treacherous behavior, when I do things that are not God's best, it actually has me looking over my shoulder for the rest of my life. Yeah. And that's not the will of the Father. And so his will is that we would, as men, be noble men. That when people see us, they're happy to see us. They trust us. I was so disappointed I found out someone that I love very much, young man I care very much about. Um, parents reached out to me, he had been stealing from his siblings broke my heart because when you find out that a person is a thief you just can't trust them I mean I want y'all to be honest when you know somebody a thief and they come in your house you got to watch them the entire time they're in there as a matter of fact what you say they don't even get to come in my house and it's the truth right so when you have a reputation that is treacherous a reputation that is dishonest yes it becomes an issue for everybody around you. But when you're a trustworthy person, when you're an individual, the other day, uh, just a minute ago, I left my phone in my office. Brother Bernard said, you need me to go to your phone, Pastor? Yeah, I went in my office. I ain't thinking, he better not go through my drawers. I trust Brother Bernard. 
because he's proven himself to be trustworthy. And the greater the trust, the greater the peace. So he says integrity speaks to honesty, proper intention, trustworthiness. And this is important, gentlemen, please hear me. Integrity don't mean you get it right all the time. That's right. It means you're consistent. You get it right most of the time. So that when you do fall short, there's grace for you. But if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, then that's how people are going to look at you. They're going to say, no, that person, if you tell a lie, you told a lie. You keep lying, you a liar. Right? You take something you shouldn't take, you stole something. We bounce back. But if you keep taking, you a thief. And so your reputation is going to be predicated on the consistency of your behavior. Integrity, I get it right most of the time. And that's important for us to be noble men of integrity. That is so important, so important because... Many people will never read the Bible, and I'm speaking this from a Christian aspect, but many people will never read the Bible, but they're going to read your life. Your life should be the Bible that they read, and if, if they're reading a false story, and our world is filled with fake, fake and falsehood now. In fact, even the news called it alternative of facts. Uh, I mean, if it's not truth, it's a lie. I mean, that's just the way it is. But anyway, your life is what people really read. They, you say you're a Christian, you say you're this, or you say you're that. That's what people look at. If you want to win them to the Lord, live the life that make them want to join you and be a part of that. And that leads us to the G. The G stands for godliness. If you're a strong man, you're a godly man. Now, here's the thing. Jerry, a lot of us don't even know what that really means, godly. What is godliness? So you think about godliness when you was growing up in church. Godliness is you got to come to church every Sunday and you got to jump and you got to shout. That's godly. No, godliness is sub submitting to the desire of God, the wishes of God, trying to walk in the likeness of God. Basically, it's this. I submit to God's commands and I do my best to look like God in the earth. What is the, what is the characteristic and the nature of God, the mind of Christ that I'm supposed to take on? You got to ask yourself, is God unforgiving? No, he's forgiving. That's a godly trait. Is God quick to anger? No. The Bible says he's slow to anger. That's a godly trait. So if I'm a high-tempered person, like you said, I don't have an even temper, then now I'm not godly. If I cuss you out every time you do something to me, that's not the behavior of a godly person. Godliness symbolizes my willingness to submit to the Father and that my image would be like him in the earth. God don't hit his kids, so men don't hit their wives. I don't care, but you don't know how mad she may be, Pastor. I had to knock her upside her head. And you're going, no, bro, that's not godly. You know, and, and listen, I'm going to tell y'all, I was married for nine years. And I remember when my marriage came to a close, when we, we had our final hoorah, she made me so mad that I saw myself knocking her out. You know, the devil will put a whole blueprint in your brain. Y'all trying to be all deep. I'm telling y'all how it go. The devil will put a blueprint in your brain or what you can do and get away with it. He was like, all you gotta do is do this, won't nobody even find out. And I said, at that point, I was like, something's gotta change because my mindset is off. This isn't godly thinking because ungodly thinking leads to ungodly behavior. If you think ungodly, you're gonna start behaving ungodly and it's gonna have a consequence on the other side of it. The problem is, now that we see all of this, Bishop, most people don't wanna be honest about the weaknesses in their lives and the areas that they're not strong and the areas we ain't working on because godliness requires work. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number seven, New Living Translation, do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. In other words, some of y'all sit up arguing with people about religion and politics and all that. He said, get off of that. That's, that's irrelevant. Instead, spend your time training yourself to be godly. Listen to that. Yeah. Brother Steve, I got to train myself to be godly. Meaning I got to work on this. I got to work on me. Anybody honest that you got some work that needs to take place in your life. I got to work on myself. I'm not perfect. I still have issues. I still got struggles. I still have things that I have not brought into submission yet. I'm still dealing with some stuff that maybe happened with your father or your mother or your siblings or something that happened in your childhood. You haven't even dealt with it. You suppressed it. But he says, work on godliness. Watch this. Physical training is good. Mill, I love this scripture because Paul says it's good to be in shape. It's good to take. He said, but it profiteth little when it comes to the spirit realm. He says this, but even though that's good, training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. So godliness don't just benefit you going to heaven. Godliness benefits your life right here on earth. I got to work on these issues in my life. I want you just for a moment to think about one area in your life. Just 
You ain't got to tell nobody. You ain't got to touch your neighbor. You ain't got to whisper in nobody's ear. Just one area in your life that you can think of, I got to get better. I got to get better. Now, we didn't talk about this whole strong thing. I'm, am I a student? Am I willing to learn? Do I have a proper temperament? Am I, am I walking in self-control? Am I a person that will be willing to repent? Am I an obedient man of God? Am I a noble person? Am I a godly person? If you really just take a moment, ask yourself the questions, what areas am I struggling in? And what areas can I improve in? Because if I improve in all of these areas, I'm going to live a life that's much better than the life I'm living right now. I don't care how good your life is. When you start really operating in the kingdom principles that have been designed and established for us, we will begin to see God do things in our lives that will change and transform us forever. And I want to encourage y'all. You, and I mean this, have got to get your pet on a leash. Some of y'all are like, what are you talking about? Your pet, P-E-T. You got to get your pet on a leash. Number one, you got to get your pride on a leash. You got to get your ego on a leash. And you got to get them temptations on a leash. Your taste, those cravings, those desires that push you. And it's different for everybody. I know I got some weed smokers in here. I know y'all probably going to roll up as soon as you leave here. But if you got to smoke every day to feel peace, then that thing controls you. And God has never called you to be under control of a substance. That's when it becomes demonic. Some of y'all in this room, man, pastor, you know, I just don't know how to be committed because the ladies love me. The ladies don't love you. They love what you do for them. And little do you know, slowly but surely, they are literally taking your soul away from you. One day you look up and you ain't as cute as you used to be. You ain't as fine as you used to be. And now you are old man chasing little girls because you lost track of time because you didn't get that under control. Your pride, your pride is the unwillingness to learn, the unwillingness to ask questions. Most men fail in life not because they have to, they don't ask questions. And one thing about me, I'm going to ask more questions than I got answers. Because the more questions I ask, the more knowledgeable I become. And a strong man is a student. You got to get your temptations under control. You got to get your ego under control. You got to get your pride under control. And that's what's going to represent a strong man. Y'all give the Lord a hand praise right there, man. I believe. S-T-R-O-N-G. Yeah, that's what it means to be strong, to be a strong man of God. Man, I hope you guys were blessed by that. I hope it was encouraging. I hope that you can send this link to somebody, let them watch it, and it will inspire them. I know even while I was watching along with you guys, I felt in the spirit there are some mothers out there really mourning your, your children that are in, incarcerated. And I want you to know there's still hope for them. We're going to continue to pray because strength is that young man's right. Or he may be an older man now, but whatever the case, we want him to be a strong man because freedom is possible. I know even sometimes the opposition seems completely impossible when the odds really do seem against you, but God is able to give spiritual freedom and even in many cases, supernaturally, natural freedom. So I'm praying for you mothers that are dealing with that and fathers that are dealing with that. But man, I hope tonight was a blessing. I'm not gonna hold y'all. We've stayed longer than usual. So everybody, let's give. Right there on the screen, you have the options to do so. You can give utilizing the Givelify application, Look of Faith Apostolic in the city of South Bend, Indiana. The Faith Alive logo will be there. You can go to our website, faithalivenow.com. Scroll down, click on the donate button. And you can give via credit card, debit card, or PayPal. You can utilize the cash apps, dollar sign FAM Center, or you can mail it in to 935 North Bendix Drive in the city of South Bend, Indiana. 46628, make all checks for money orders payable to FAM. That's Faith Alive Ministries, FAM. I appreciate you guys immensely. Listen, this Sunday, I have a word from the Lord about finishing what you start. Y'all don't want to miss it. So tune in at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time online and then 11 a.m. in-house. I got something special for y'all. I promise you guys been doing some great things in South Bend, Indiana. If you can make it to the in-house service, do so 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. But if not, join us right here on YouTube at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It'll be a blessing to you. Look, y'all have a great day today. Say it with me. One, two, three. Every debt is canceled. Every bill is paid. My body is healed. My mind is regulated. My family is restored. The devil is defeated in Jesus' name. And we are above only. God bless you guys, and I'll see y'all Sunday. Giving at Faith Alive is very easy. You can give by using the Givelify app. Just look up Faith Apostolic Ministries in South Bend, Indiana, or scan the QR code on the screen. You can give with the Cash App. Send your gift to dollar sign FAM Center. You can also give by going to our website, faithalivenow.com. Scroll down and click on the donate button, and you will be able to use PayPal, a debit card, or a credit card to give your financial gift. 
Lastly, if you prefer, you can mail your gift to Faith Alive Ministries, 935 North Bendix Drive, South Bend, Indiana, 46628. We appreciate all of you who give to this ministry. We pray God's blessings upon you and your household. This ain't church as usual. Can't you tell by the music, bro? Can't you tell by the love you felt? Before you took one step through the door. And that next level teaching God is reaching higher every week. Frequent flyers speaking life despite deceased and viral. Meant we in cause he's inside. It's not a private party, you're invited. Come in tired, believe inspired. All generations, even cyber. Find us on the web like these some spiders. Uh, let's slow it down so you understand how it's going down. Up in here, there's one rule. Gotta love everybody that comes through. Them doors, in short. Grace is what we endorse. Faith is what we help grow. Welcome to the fam center, you know.